Look at that thing! <laughs> it's the middle of winter, the roads are horrible, and we're driving across the state for seven hours to go ice fishing. Honestly, I thought we were being kind of hardcore. Little did I know, when we would pull up to the parking lot, us Montanans would be outnumbered 10 to 1 by rigs from Minnesota, who had more than doubled down on the amount of travel distance to get here. Yeah, Minnesota, the place that I always imagined being the ice fishing capital of the United States. They have 14,000 of their own lakes, all sorts of species to fish for. I mean, there's literally a plowed ice highway on Lake of the Woods. Really? There's something that special that they'll drive 15 plus hours away from the land of the lakes to Montana. So what's the draw? Alrighty. Lake trout. About to hopefully break in this new rod here. Normally you don't fish ice fish with the like 30 pound braid and a big old long heavy action rod like this. We're out here for some lake trout, something that I've never done. I don't think Marcus has ever done it either. Nope. Jonathan's behind the camera. We just got out here. We got, I don't know, an hour or so to, to fish. So we're going to make the most of it. But we don't really know what we're doing. We're going to try and figure it out. Fishing some deep water for these big old lake trout. Big old swim bait jigger thing. Soft plastic. That's a bad knot I just tied. Something white, big. There's Cisco in the system for main forage base. We've talked about this in other Anyfins episodes, but this is kind of something that might look like that. So we're gonna see. We're fishing like, I don't know, Marcus just said 70 some feet of water. We've heard that lake trout can be anywhere from 40 to 80 to 100 feet. So we'll see. Sorry, mom. <laughs> Everything that I've heard about ice fishing for lake trout, you need to be super mobile and the features that you're looking for in the water is points going out into deeper water. Some of them drop down super steep, some of them drop down super mellow. We're looking for steep drop off points and fishing anywhere from 20 to 80 feet of water. On this trip, we've had most of the fish follow our lures in about 50 foot, but we've heard from people that they've caught them in 30 feet. They really have a wide range of where they can be. The few things that are consistent between everything that I've researched and what I've talked to people who've been successful with is you fish one hole for 15 minutes. If you don't have an active fish chasing your lure, you move. And you wanna target those depths between 20 and 80 feet. During the winter when the water temperatures are super cold, they actually put their feed bag on. They're, it opens up more of the water column to them because they're a fish that likes to stay in, in cold water most of the year. So summer months, if you were to come out here, you'd be fishing for them in that 100 plus foot range. I was reading something about lake trout the other day that they'll actually sometimes be in sh shallower water and be busting bait fish up towards the ice and corner them essentially and eat them. So really cool fish. Um, if we were able to catch some of them, you're able to bring these fish up from like a hundred foot of water. They're able to release the air from their swim bladder as they come up and it doesn't kill them like a walleye or a perch. We use a product called Navionic. It's a, essentially underwater taupe topo map. It just shows the features of the lake. Once you find that depth range, I've heard that they don't really veer from that depth range. You, they, there might be a point jetting out into deep water and it may be 10-15 feet for them to just swim over it 
and and cruise along the shore again but they'll actually stay in that depth range and go around a point and come back around and and follow that depth contour so that's uh the tactics for for trying to catch a lake trout through the ice We fish from first light to last light every day, and we absolutely got our asses handed to us. But we still had a blast. We had a fun crew, we got to see a new area, and we attempted a new style of fishing for us that we had never done before. Plus the consolation prize of catching one on the tip up was pretty sweet. We've talked about Fort Peck in the past and how it's an incredibly altered fishery. Basically a giant aquarium that we get to play with, argue about, and toss in numerous non-native fish species. And lake trout are no exception. They were planted into the system in the mid-1950s, and by the 70s into the 80s, it was a popular sport fish amongst anglers. According to past creel surveys, lake trout are the fourth most desired fish in the lake, trailing behind walleye, Chinook salmon, and northern pike. So in Fort Peck, lake trout are a little bit down the hierarchy list, both in terms of numbers and angler interest. However, on the other end of the state, a very different dynamic has played out over the past 40 years. Flathead Lake, 126,000 acres of the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. At least that's what Wikipedia tells me. Also, calling it a lake is uh, not entirely accurate. It was a massive lake, but they tossed Kerr Dam onto the outlet in 1930, raising the water level by about 10 feet. It is not as altered as many of our other fisheries, at least not as physically altered. The physical aspects of the system still host a pretty good habitat for the native fish, which is a luxury that is often lost when rivers are dammed. But the native bull trout and cutthroat trout do utilize the lake for parts of the year and have habitat to be successful. However, some of the biological aspects of the fishery have been very altered. Right now, lake trout are the dominant fish species in the lake. I've heard estimates of everything from 400,000 fish to 1.6 million fish. So who knows really? Regardless, there is a lot. Lake trout did not always rule the flathead. Not that long ago, it was kokanee salmon. The salmon's reign in power lasted from 1916 until the 1980s. An entire industry evolved around the salmon. Anglers enjoyed snagging for the plentiful tasty fish. Tourists would flock to see the spectacle of bears and eagles coming down to catch the spawning salmon that were running up Flathead River or McDonald Creek. But in 1981, everything changed. Fisheries managers decided that they wanted to add a little extra food to the system for the kokanee. Figured if they added a bigger food source, like mysis shrimp, it could benefit the salmon. Well, turns out, mysis shrimp are active during the times of the day when kokanee are inactive. But guess what species the new food source was available to? Lake trout. Lake trout began to thrive. They were able to take advantage of the mysis shrimp, while the kokanee could not. The salmon tanked. By 1989, just nine years after mysis were introduced, Kokanee were completely eliminated from the lake. Lake trout absolutely exploded. Being the predator that they are, they started eating and outcompeting the younger native bull trout and cutthroat trout as well. And this is the part of any fishery story that I find fascinating. The shifting culture of angler preference. Once the kokanee were gone, they were pretty hard to advocate for. But now, with the big predatory fish that are fun to catch, anglers began to advocate for the Mackinac. A new economy formed. People showed up to fish for the Lakers and it helped support small town businesses. A guiding industry expanded and people began to advocate for a trophy fishery. The angling culture evolved and helped push for the state to implement a reverse slot limit where you cannot keep fish between 30 and 36 inches. Now this is where things get even more interesting. The south half of the lake is managed by the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes, and the north half is managed by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Same body of water, different management theories. The reservation has a policy of wanting to preserve the native fish populations by reducing the lake trout populations by 75%. To accomplish this, there's large-scale gill netting efforts 
along with incentives to promote anglers to harvest fish. The tribes host two contests annually called Mac Days. On the south end of the lake, the limit is 100 fish per day, and every year there's a fish that's tagged with a $10,000 reward. They also tag other fish with various levels of cash prizes, and anglers that bring in 11 or more fish receive some cash, and the bounty keeps going up the more fish that they bring in. 121,000 lake trout were removed from the flathead last year from Mac Days and gill netting alone. In order to keep up with their 75% reduction, they need to harvest 140,000 fish per year every year. They also state that it's not their goal to completely eliminate the fish from the lake, which is pretty much impossible anyways, but rather to suppress them and maintain the native fishery in conjunction with the lake trout. Another interesting aspect of the tribal netting is that it's a commercial fishery. They process, package, and sell the trout at various grocery stores and restaurants. Meanwhile, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, in the same lake, still has a trophy fishery management regulation with the reverse slot limit, where you cannot keep lakers between 30 and 36 inches. It sounds like there are negotiations to find some common ground on management, but when you have multiple user groups all advocating for what they care about, it gets tricky. After getting our butts kicked on Fort Peck, we were eager to get back out on the water for some redemption on these fish. And of course, the first afternoon fishing session was a complete fail. But the next morning, we had high hopes of getting bent on a few lake trout. And I'm not going to lie, running this tiny aluminum boat multiple miles to our first spot in a massive lake had me feeling a little uneasy. I'm just kind of idling around because this, this hummingbird here allows you to make your own map and it'll get like depth contours. So I'm, I've logged a bunch of depth contours here. And again, we're not experts. We haven't, we haven't caught one rod and reel. Uh, but these lake trout allegedly like these steep drop-offs anywhere from like 30, they can be into like 300 feet which is crazy. So that's kind of what the plan is to kind of putt around and find these areas. This point looks pretty good coming off right here, this rocky point. It uh, has this nice drop off and uh, we're just gonna kind of fish around this island and uh, see if we can find us a, a lake trout or two. Vertical jigging is the name of the game here. We're using medium action rods with braided or fluorocarbon line because mono lines stretch too much when you're jigging two to three ounce weights. It's not the most thrilling way to fish, but it sure beats trolling or watching a bobber. Oh shit, there's one. Right there. You got I got him, I got him, I got him. <laughs> Finally! <laughs> oh my gosh, they exist! They're not unicorns. I saw one on the screen. This is a bigger one. Whew. Dos. Yeah. <laughs> Remember how I was like all up? <laughs> yeah, Marcus, let's go. Yes. Horse and baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It feels like a good fish, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yes, dude. <laughs> right. Dude. That's an awesome fish, dude. 
Lake trout fishing can be incredibly boring when they're not biting. Many times I've jigged with absolutely nothing happening, but when there finally is a tug back while lifting up the rod, it's pretty damn exciting. There we go, dude. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go, bro. Dude, what a freaking dog. Oh, it's too big for the net. <laughs> oh my. We'll let that one go. Dude, what? <laughs> I had pretty mixed feelings about letting the fish go. For one, I really like eating trout. Two, they are undoubtedly negatively impacting the native cutthroat and bull trout. And three, the tribe is putting an insane amount of resources into removing them, so it seems silly to just toss them back. But some of the fish that we caught were in that slot limit, or we accidentally hooked them outside the mouth. So legally, we had to release them back. That's a big one. That is a big fish. That was sick. The wind started to pick up in the afternoon, and we decided to make the run back to the ramp before any white caps arrived. It felt really good to finally catch a few Lakers after all the effort we put into them this past winter and spring. After these trips, I found a new respect for the lake trout. They live in amazing places, and they're everything you could want in a sport fish. A big, aggressive predator that fight like hell, that are challenging to catch, and super rewarding when you do hook one. I think it's always good to remember though, we can have all sorts of thoughts about the impact that we have as anglers, but until Michael and I get better at catching lake trout, our handful of fish that we either keep or release isn't going to put that much of a dent in the population. The fish that we could keep, however, were extremely tasty. Of the trout that I've consumed, they were some of the darkest colored flesh that I've seen. It's good. It's like good trout. I mean, trout is super variable, but this is up there. Where will we be next week? Who knows? But be sure to come back because anything goes. <laughs> <laughs>